Um, I'm delighted now to just uh, bridge to the next panel. Um, we will bring the speakers to the forefront in, in just a minute. Um, the person moderating the panel is uh, Theodora, who is one of our editors, and I can tell you that she has been a central force behind this conference. Uh, so everything you like about the conference is pretty much her initiative. So Theodora, thank you very much. Uh, and I see that all the speakers are here right on time. So Theodora, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Thibaut. Thank you for this very kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to moderate this rather unprecedented event and particularly this panel, which will assess how micro directives can be used to address both the under and over inclusive nature of the existing merger control regime. To keep the cinema theme that you have keep that you kept bringing up throughout the conference, we can easily say that we have uh, an all star cast for this panel. Our three speakers are um, Anthony Casey and Anthony Niblet, who authored the paper that will be discussed, and Daniel Greenwood, who will share with us his comments, questions, and concerns about the paper. Now, let me tell you a bit more about each of them. Anthony Casey is Donald M. Ephraim Professor of Law and Economics and the Faculty Director of the Center on Law and Finance at the University of Chicago Law School. Anthony Niblet is an Associate Professor at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law and also the Canada Research Chair in Law, Economics and Innovation. For the lawyers among us, the Casey Niblet duo is a household name. So it's indeed a great honor to have them, to have them here with us. Now, the same holds true for Daniel Greenwood, who just joined us, hello, and who is the founder of civics.com, a boutique provider of consultancy services for legal technologies, as well as a researcher at MIT Media Lab, where he works at the forefront of computational law. So very lucky to have him here indeed. For the next 20 minutes, the Casey Niblet duo will present their paper. Please feel free to share your questions in the Q&A section at all times. Professor Casey, Professor Niblet, thank you for agreeing to present your paper. The floor is yours, you have 20 minutes. Wonderful, thank you very much, Theodore. Um, would I be able to be made a host so that I can share my screen, please? Yes, of course. Thank you. In the meantime, I promised myself not to intervene, but Daza, you promised me a hat and I can see it's here now. So I'm waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> Do a good job finishing the conference and a hat you will have. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much, Thibault. Thank you very much, everybody, um, for inviting us. Uh, my name is Anthony Niblett. This is me over here. Uh, I'm at the University of Toronto, Faculty of Law. I'm also a faculty affiliate with the Vector Institute of Artificial Intelligence uh, here at the U of T. And I'm, this is a co-author paper with Tony Casey, who's at the University of Chicago. Our paper is called uh, Micro Directives and Computational Merger Review. And this term micro directives comes from a previous paper that Tony and I wrote a number of years ago, a number of years ago called The Death of Rules and Standards. And this paper was uh, basically a thought experiment about what's going to happen when predictive technologies get better and better, and how predictive technologies will uh, change the structure of law. And so we investigate what happens when you have unprecedented and exponential growth in data, what happens when you have supervised machine learning algorithms get better and better at predicting. And with this better predictive technology, that will enable legislators, regulators, judges to make better law. Armed with better information, you can make more tailored rules. So these coarse rules, these bright line rules that we currently depend on can be improved upon. Bright line rules tend to be over-inclusive and under-inclusive. You can improve upon that with better prediction. Standards tend to be vague and create uncertainty and are rife with bias and inconsistency. And you can take those standards and if you can predict better, you can give those standards uh, more ex-ante content. And so we said, well, you're going to move away from rules because rules have costs and you're going to uh, improve upon rules. You're going to move away from standards and you can improve upon standards. And this gives way to a new form of law that we called uh, the micro directive. And we were invited to submit a paper for the journal and for this conference. And we thought, why not apply these ideas about the micro directive 
to something in antitrust and that is merger notification and review. Merger notification and review is something that has rules and it has standards and how can we improve upon uh, merger notification and review. So that's what our paper looks at. It's how can we use these predictive technologies, supervised machine learning, et cetera, to improve merger review. And we start off by taking the extreme version. And we imagine what would, what would it look like if you could have micro directives for merger review, essentially automating, fully automating the merger review process that parties to a transaction could enter all their relevant information and receive an almost instantaneous response from the agencies. What we conclude though, is that there are limits here and there are a number of limits and you can think of the limits of being limits about data. You can think about the limits of technological feasibility. You can think about the limits of trust and legitimacy in such a system. But for us, the biggest uh, limit um, here is a very human problem. And that is, the difficulty in specifying what the objective actually is. What values do we want to promote? What is it that this artificially intelligent algorithm should be maximizing? And that for us is the biggest hurdle. That's not to say that there aren't hurdles about data, legitimacy, um, trust, etc. But for us, the biggest hurdle is the hurdle in, of specifying what the objective actually is. So this is one way we think about the, the current notification regime. This is the, the notification regime in the United States. And one thing you'll notice is there, there are some very bright line rules in here. And there's some very bright line rules that depending on the size of the transaction, depending on the size of the, the person test, these are bright line rules depending on whether you notify or not. And when you've got bright line rules, this typically results in over-inclusivity and under-inclusivity. And just to do a very, very simple way of thinking about this, you can imagine a mapping of competitive concerns from low competitive concern about a merger all the way up to high. And there's notification thresholds that are in place to screen out certain mergers. If you have a bright line rule, you now that could be fine for certain types of mergers where you've got high competitive concerns and they're above the threshold, that's fine, that's great. Where you've got low competitive concerns and it's below the threshold, again, that's great. But these bright line rules are unlikely to be uh, predictive of uh, the competitive concerns. And you're going to end up with some situations where there's low competitive concern, but still required to be notified. And this leaves you with a world of over-inclusivity. That these resource constrained agencies are being required to review mergers that are not likely to generate competition concerns. They're quote unquote inconsequential, and yet we still have to devote resources to looking at, at, at this. Also has costs for the merging parties. It might disrupt beneficial mergers. It might even chill beneficial mergers. So over-inclusivity over is a problem. On the other hand, you could have uh, mergers that are high competitive concerns, and yet they fall below the, merge, the, the notification threshold. Somewhat of which we were talk, uh, talking about with the previous paper, but this under-inclusivity allows potentially anti-competitive mergers to fly under the radar. So the current system is both over-inclusive and under-inclusive of notification. And these problems can't be fixed by just adjusting the threshold. If you lower the threshold, to try and capture some of those high competitive concerns, then you're just going to increase the, the number of false positives. You're just going to increase the number, the over-inclusivity and vice versa. The way to do this is to get better ex-ante predictions, to get better ex-ante predictions about what types of problems there are and what types of uh, mergers require further review. And so, we look at uh, some types of predictive tools and we say, well, we can improve upon these notification rules. We can improve upon the standards uh, in merger review, trying to work out what substantially lessening competition means. So agencies could move away from bright line rules in the notification process. You could also provide greater ex ante content about what the, the, these, these standards are. So we've got substantially lessened competition here in Canada, but you could provide uh, more content to those um, to those vague standards. 
in a fully automated system, what you would imagine is that parties could be told instantaneously. They get a red light or a green light as to whether their merger is deemed likely to substantially lessen competition. So transactions of high risk are, are flagged immediately. Proposed transactions that are at very low risk are given the instantaneous green light. Now, this system is not necessarily feasible with the, uh, the current toolkit. And a lot of the discussion in the previous paper was about, well, how do we improve that, that, that toolkit? Um, we discussed a couple of ways in which the agency's toolkit could be improved to help push along, uh, push towards the direction of having more micro directives uh, in merger review. And the two systems we talk about use different types of data, and they have very different prediction problems. So the first type of data are internal agency data on which mergers have been reviewed, which ones have been approved, which ones have been challenged. And then the second type of data is external data on the consequences of mergers. And I'll talk about each of these um, in a bit more detail. But I think it's extremely important to separate the two. It's extremely important to separate the two because they have different prediction problems. They solve different types of prediction problems. The first one, if you're going to use internal agency data on merger approval, then what you're doing is you're predicting whether the, type, the merger that's being proposed would have created concerns in the past. That's really what you're doing. It's a replication in some sense. When you've got external data and you're looking at the consequences, it's more like doing retrospectives, but um, more fully fleshed out retrospectives, where you're trying to predict the risk levels of various harms, increases in prices, reduced quality, reduced innovation, etc. Let's just talk about this first one first, internal agency data. How could we use internal agency data to improve uh, merger notification and review? Well, we looked back at the numbers and we saw that there's over the last 20 years, there's been about 30,000 notified transactions in the United States. And one way to, to think about this is you could turn this into structured data. You could turn this into structured data to provide predictions of how future transactions would be dealt with. And you might be thinking, well, that's, that's you know, a lot of work to put that together, that the data is not structured in that way. Um, there's all sorts of problems with doing this. And but this is something that we have done in Canadian tax law. And we have taken unstructured data from cases, thousands and thousands of cases, and we have turned them into structured data. And you can use, these are data that describe every single case that's ever gone to court. Uh, in Canadian tax law on particular issues. And so one particular issue, I'll just give you an example right now, that one particular issue is, well, is a worker, are they classified as an employee or are they an independent contractor? And that's a very vague standard, but we've turned the thousands of cases on that issue into data. And so you can come along with a new case, you fill out your information about what your case is about, information about uh, what kind of work is it, how much control is being exerted by the firm, uh, who has the freedom to turn down work, what tools are being used, etc. who has the risk here, are they being reimbursed, um, and then you can take all those facts and compare it to every case that's ever gone to court in the past, and you can make a prediction. You can make a prediction that if this case goes to court, this particular worker would be classified as an employee. And this is just a prediction problem that is trying to replicate what's been done in the past. And so it uses a structured data set to predict what would happen with a new case. And you can imagine similar tools being used in merger review. You take the unstructured data in agency decisions. It's a bit of human effort to turn that into structured data that describe those decisions. But then when the next one comes along, you can make a prediction as to, well, is this the kind of thing that has internally generated concerns in the past? Is this a benign merger or is this something that we should be challenging? Now, this has benefits. It has benefits in terms of the speed with which you can provide an answer. It has benefits in terms of the consistency. It's not dependent on which human reviewer um, is given the, the task of reviewing the merger. The algorithm treats every algorithm, uh, teach, uh, 
like algorithms alike. Essentially, you are replicating what the agencies have done. Now that's, for some people, a problem because perhaps you think that the agencies have not done things correctly in the past, and perhaps you think that the standards should be changing. Perhaps you think that uh, with this growth in data by companies, that that's opening up a new problem that we, we've got to address. And so maybe we don't want to do this. If your objective, though, is to give fast responses, if your objective is to give consistent responses, consistent with what's been done in the past, then this is a good system. But if, you're, if you think that the law should be more dynamic than that, then this obviously is not a good system for you. In that case, then you want to use the external data that describes some of the consequences of mergers. And so you're looking at predicting the risk levels of various harms, the increases in prices, reduced quality, et cetera. And in a number of areas of law, we've seen that researchers have been able to use big data and machine learning algorithms to show that machine learning algorithms actually improve upon human decision making. And so that there's a number of papers, for example, on bail showing how machine learning algorithms are better than judges at predicting risk. And you can imagine in the context of mergers, getting data on market structure, conduct of firms, etc., will enable you to provide much richer and more accurate future predictions. In some sense, this is basically like taking the current system of retrospective, uh, respect, retrospectives and just fleshing it out to better understand what these errors are and better calibrate the law. Now, the current system could be thought of as a system of triage, that these predictive um, that we're basically just trying to triage, you know, if it's a small merger, it's unlikely to uh, generate any concerns. The predictive algorithms improve upon this, improve upon this as a pre-screening tool. And you can imagine, rather than going to the fully automated system, that what we do is uh, simply use these as a screening mechanism. For us, the biggest hurdle to a fully automated system is not technological feasibility. It's not the volume of data. It's not the type of data. It's not legitimacy. The biggest hurdle is spelling out what the objectives are. And these supervised machine learning algorithms make predictions based on a particular objective. And that requires us to be extraordinarily clear about what we want our merger law to achieve. What is the objective of merger law? Is that purpose translatable into an objective that an algorithm could maximize? Ultimately for us, these algorithms can't solve the human problem of selecting the objective. It's like having a self-driving car, but if the humans don't know what destination to enter, the self-driving car is not that helpful for you. And so we, in our paper, we discuss how competition authorities have a variety of different objectives. It's not like we have a single objective for any, um, for any antitrust authority. In Canada, for example, we've got all sorts of different objectives. We want to promote efficiency, expand opportunities for Canadian participation, ensure that medium and small enterprises have an equitable opportunity to participate, provide consumers with competitive prices and choices. And some of these objectives are found in other jurisdictions too. In Japan, protect small and medium sized enterprises. In China, protect the ex and expand domestic enterprises. In South Africa, they've got a whole slew of different objectives based on um, the need to have greater ownership by a greater number of South Africans to promote fair distribution of ownership among different racial groups, balance the interest of workers, owners, and consumers. And in Europe, you know, enable the, the proper functioning of the EU's internal market for the benefit of citizens, businesses, and societies as a whole. It's extraordinarily difficult to try and put that into one translatable uh, objective. And some of the Americans in the audience might be thinking, well, our objective is much clearer. It's maximize consumer welfare. Now, that might be, might be true. It might also, that objective might be changing. And even if the objective was maximize consumer welfare, that's still very difficult to translate into an objective for an algorithm. Are we maximizing consumer surplus or are we maximizing total surplus? Or is it like in Canada where we're actually maximizing something in between? 
even if we are maximizing something in between, how much weight should we place on consumers as, as opposed to producers? When you've got multi-sided markets, there are important questions about which consumers are benefiting and how much weight should we put on each of those consumers? How much weight should we put on non-price variables like quality, service, availability, all those things that affect consumer welfare that are less easy to translate into dollar figures. And importantly, how do we balance today versus tomorrow? How do we balance static efficiency versus dynamic efficiency? Now, that's not to say that this can't be done on a case-by-case -case basis. In fact, that's exactly what is done on a case-by-case -case basis. The problem emerges when you try and put an ex-ante system in place. It would require agencies to be very, very clear about how they view these various considerations, how they make these balancing calls. At the moment, it's done on a case-by-case -case basis, so the agencies have a great deal of discretion how to balance those objectives. But if we moved to computational merger review, that would require agencies to be extraordinarily explicit about how these different objectives are being balanced. And it would require them to commit to those balances and those objectives up front. So in conclusion, look, Tony and I have been accused of being uh, techno-utopians. Um, we're not techno-utopians, but we do see that there's enormous benefit here. There's enormous benefit that that can come from more data than from better innovation of predictive technologies to improve the merger notification and review system. There's no doubt that there are enormous benefits. But the technology also exposes some of the limits of antitrust, some of the limits of computational antitrust, and some of the limitations of law altogether. That the biggest roadblock is not data, it's not technology, it's not legitimacy or trust, the biggest roadblock for us is what do we want the law to do? What is it that we want merger law to achieve? I think, uh, Margaret Levenstein in her talk on Monday said, you know, AI can help us make better decisions, but it can't make those decisions for us. And that's kind of where we end up with our paper. And so with that, I will hand it back to you, Teodora. Thank you very much for the insightful presentation. Thank you for being right on time. I'm sure that the thoughts you shared with us will generate a very lively discussion, both on how computational tools can optimize merger control and on the normative side of what objectives antitrust should pursue. To get the discussion started, I will uh, hand it over to Daniel, or should I say Daza? Uh, Greenwood. Yeah, uh, I accept both, uh, but you can call me Daza, just between us. Okay, just between us, Daza, I am very happy to give you the floor, and I must confess that I am particularly excited to hear your comments, since you shared with me privately that you've been a fan of the Casey Niblet duo well before this conference. So and here is to you, you have 10 minutes, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Theodora and, uh, and Thibaut and Codex for putting this on, and yes, it's true, I am a fan. <laughs> uh, and. We've actually published um, one of their prior works in the MIT Computational Law Report, and um, and you know right, I think you know right in tune with that. Uh, this paper is is truly excellent. Um, so uh, I believe that they're looking at the right things. And so following on from Sandy Pentland and teams. Um, conversation just moments ago, here again, we see a focus on data um, and we see a focus on um, a real time application. That was a theme from the last panel as well. Um, and we see a focus on um, more to the point now taking it one step further, which is partly why I'm such a fan of this and it's sequenced so well in the day. It's, it's particularly applied you know, to a, a very specific aspect of merger review. Uh, and so the suggestion for a computational merger review scheme, um, I think is uh, that is nicely positioned such that there's a, it has academic merit, but it's really begs to be taken the next level of, uh, in terms of uh, action. And of course, action is the, the name of the, of this track of the conference. Um, but the reason specifically is that by narrowing the context and the scope um, to this aspect of merger review, now we can have a tractable 
engineerable, um, uh, um, testable, uh, even capable of deployment, um, you know, kind of idea. Um, so this is particularly delightful, I think. Um, so let me just go down one level and make a couple of observations, and then I actually do have some questions. So um, I'm glad that the authors are with us. Uh, the w w one of the observations is that as as um, specific as the paper is on on this um, scope of merger review uh, and the you know the possibility of a very practical benefit among other things of just shortening the the time for review for for you know kind of easy yeses that just seems like low hanging fruit. Um, it also reveals a, a major um, ambiguity that ought to be resolved, almost has to be resolved in order to uh, architect and, and test a computational merger review scheme such as this, namely, as, as the authors just mentioned, you know, the, the goals uh, and the objectives. And um, I didn't really appreciate until I read the paper how varied um, the goals of antitrust and competition law are internationally, um, like just very, very different things and idiosyncratic to the kind of social and political and economic priorities of, of, of the jurisdictions. But e even in the U.S., it, it, the goals are somewhat squishy and they seem to be somewhat subjective or, or change uh, in context. That is not a starting criteria for a system to be engineered algorithmically. Um, something that... Um, that Sandy says a lot, Sandy Pentland, but that we definitely take as a mantra at, in, uh, at law.mit.edu is that we need to do law differently in order to uh, successfully transition to, uh, to computational systems in many respects, but the, perhaps the, the most challenging one is way upstream with legislators and with regulators to, to be for, for them to start to make law differently such that there are um, d defined um, sort of objectively measurable goals attached to the rules um, that they are promulgating. Um, and I think that the authors do a very fine job of highlighting that as an open question. Um, I think the challenge is to answer the question uh, as part of embracing and trying the approach of this paper. Um, and so I, I would like to, um, I guess, first highlight that, but I guess the question would be, how might one um, post postulate and, and test examples of um, high-level policy goals and you know, lower-level regulatory objectives and, and the different priorities in ways that are um, uh, capable of expression in, in objective, testable systems. Um, and, and ideally, to, to how might one do so? It, I would think, in, if it were part of law, not like in a um, very specific like language, like Python or something, but actually in a way that's more like a math syllogism that could be reduced to different code bases and different models and different algorithms, and still be um, still be capable of independent verification that we're you know achieving the goal. Um, this is not a normal way to do. I mean, sorry, I shouldn't say normal. This is not a customary way to do law. I think it it's a very reasonable and almost uh, expected. And I'm just going to stick my neck out to say necessary com capability that we'll need to resolve, not just in antitrust but in general. Uh, and yet it's an open question and the authors really put their finger on right on the, the pulse of it in their paper. Um, and I, I hope that by doing so, it can spark conversation at Codex and beyond and, and in industry and government as well to start putting um, potential solutions to that on uh, together. When I say solutions, I just mean, how do you do it? Um, like, I'm not even talking about what should the policy be at this point. Uh, and so... One other thing I wanted to touch on was to go one level deeper on this wonderful insight about uh, the need for data. So there's a lot of assertions in the paper that we have all the data 
Um, and so I guess, you know, arguably, it's true that the, the data exists. The, the concept that we like have it in some way that something could be done with it, I think deserves a little bit more attention. And um, so from a just very, again, in the theme of this action um, track of the conference, I think it would be interesting to talk a little bit about what are examples of data sets that would be typical in business and in you know your standard enterprise systems, for example, um, to uh, maybe in the broad categories of pricing, uh, market share, uh, market um, um, what, like um, size of the transaction, HHI, size of the parties. Like I'm thinking of accounting systems. I'm thinking, uh, you know, Salesforce. I'm thinking NetSuite. I'm thinking you know, there's all these different system systems that exist that I work on all day, um, typically as a consultant. But where do we, like, what systems and what data could you derive, like, through ETL and, and, and other wrangling methods, the kind of input data necessary for the algorithms that we're talking about? And to the extent that that's a bespoke, idiosyncratic, you know, data science job every time, that's okay. But, you know, is that going to actually exceed the 30 day, you know, benefit on, on this application area? And, and, and more to the point, how much value does it leave on the table? If we don't, if, if there aren't standard, repeatable, widely deployed ways to collect and, and transform and make accessible this kind of data, because this, this juncture merger review certainly is a great use case. But there's a lot of law and regulation out there that would benefit from th this type of data. And by the way, I think the biggest benefit of having exactly the kind of data needed for merger review is just doing business. Like every time I'm on a team in, in companies that are trying to figure out a marketing thing or, you know, uh, um, d different um, product questions and different strategy questions, we're asking questions that, um, could be largely answered by the same data that would be needed for these reviews. And it's always like scramble the, you know, the fighter jets and do a data science team to get this together and wrangle it. So eventually we're going to, I just want to just throw out there, there's going to need to be a way to have a more standard approaches. And I'd love to hear as a start from this regulatory antitrust review perspective, what example data sets that are common in business would you think would be inputs so so we can just start thinking about that and in closing i guess i would just ask this which is in line with the um with the um uh, with lo the last session's question about how soon could this be ready um my question would be how would you how could you envision deploying this if, if let's say an antitrust agency was interested to take you up on this and, and to give it a try the one question I would ask is how, how, how would you structure a pilot or a test such that you could um, determine whether it succeeded? Like what would be the metrics that you would want to test to know that applying this method was better than what we have now? And then how, how could you structure uh, a pilot, I guess, let's call it, or a test of the system, such that it could provide that answer. So those are those are some of my initial reviews and questions. But overall, I just want to say, well done. This is uh, this is such a great paper, and you're really pointing pointing the direction to how to apply sometimes highfalutin seeming concepts of computational law in a way that can that can provide real benefit in the economy and in society. So thank you for this, and I provide the mic back to the um, to the conference. Thank you very much, Dasa, for your questions and for your comments. Does any of the Antonis, or perhaps both, want to jump in on any of that? Sure, I'll, I'll, uh, I just want to come in on the big picture point, because I think it's super important. Um, the idea that, and Daza and I have talked about this before, that this here and elsewhere requires law to be done differently. Um, and, and I think this is a good thing and a bad thing. And the bad thing is it's super hard, right? Like we will see that defining the objective of law 
uh, is a lot harder than people kind of recognize before when you try to put it into, into a codable format or you know, in, into you have the data tell you what to do. Now, the, the, the good thing is, I, I think it's going to require a little more honesty about what law is doing. I think that's a good thing. The, the flip side of that is it'll reveal a little bit of the dishonesty that's been out there when people are like, oh, this is what we're trying to accomplish. You're like, no, you're not. Like, we, when, we, when we wanted you to put that into code, you said, no, let's change it. And so, you know, from, from the good side is it does require that honesty about like, this is why we have the law. Um, but it's gonna reveal that, that a lot of times we don't know, or a lot of times we're punting because we, we don't agree. And there was in the Q and A, Caroline Thomas had a good point of, you know, where, where do, who makes that decision? It doesn't have to be the legislatures. The legislatures might punt to the regulators and the regulators might be the one who have to turn the fuzzy objective into something real. But someone does have to do that at some point. Um, and again, I, I think that's true in the antitrust field and elsewhere. And we're gonna be seeing this throughout, you know, whenever a micro directive becomes possible, people are gonna say, wait, what was the law doing for the last 200 years? And I think as we kind of point out in this article and Anthony highlighted in antitrust, there's so many possibilities and there's so much right now where people are talking past each other because they have such vast different goals. Um, so I think that, I, I like that does it point out that challenge. I think it's, it's very important. So if Anthony wanted to add anything on that. I'll, I'll just add something to the, the calls for action that you talked about, Daz. Hi, Daz, good to see you again. Um, just with regards to, and this is why it's so important to, to think about the different types of algorithms, uh, different types of data, and the different types of prediction problems that are coming out of this. And so, you know, the data exists as it pertains to internal agency data. It, it exists in an unstructured form. And so there's effort that's going to have to be taken, undertaken, if you wanted to go down this route, to... Uh, turn that into structured data. And what's the payoff? Well, the payoff is you essentially get an agency decision quicker, but it's replicating what's, what's been done in the past. And so, you know, you think about the 30-day the waiting period, if you can, in, you know, get the benefit from that straight away, that's, that's an enormous benefit. How much does it cost to put that into place? Well, we've done this with a small team in Canadian tax law. We've turned, you know, the, some of these cases... Um, you know, some of these cases have fewer variables or fewer, fewer features than some of these uh, mergers, but it's, it's not, you know, it's not um, exorbitant costs. I mean, it's possible to do this, to turn the unstructured data into structured data, to come up with, a, you know, at least a, a triaging system for working out the probability of concern or something like that. That's with regards to that internal data. With regards to your the, the, the broader question about, you know, what, what other data do you need about pricing, et cetera? Um, and, you know, we, we talk about HHI and market shares. For us, the biggest concern here is actually not the, the volume of data and, and putting something into practice. It's about somebody tagging these things, tagging these things as this was wrong. We shouldn't have done this. We shouldn't have let this merger go through. Or actually, you know, we should have let this one go through. It turns out that, you know, that that's going to be the big problem is identifying what the error was in the past. And if you can't identify what the error was in the past, then it's very difficult to actually have this, uh, th this mechanism for predicting, you know, uh, for predicting the consequences in some sense. And so, um, you know, with, with regards to the bail papers that I talked about, there's a very clear objective that you're looking at flight risk here. It's what risks are we looking at here and which ones should we be concerned about? And that's the human problem of, we don't know where the self-driving car should go. And so it's very difficult. It's very difficult for us. If we don't know what the destination is, the self-driving car is of limited value. Reza, do you want to have a quick go at that? Um, Yes, uh, I guess. So first of all, thank you for those reflections. Um, and I guess I would just like to and also, um, Anthony, I wasn't I don't think I'm familiar with the examples you're describing in Canada. And in case I'm not the only one, those sound very relevant and perhaps very helpful, um, you know, more broadly. Would you just take a moment to to describe those and maybe with a little extra emphasis on how they might be applied um, in the United States and other jurisdictions, please? Sure. I mean, so um, we, uh, with along uh, myself and a couple of academics at uh, University of Toronto, we've been putting together 
Um, we have a startup that puts together um, we're turning unstructured cases in tax law into structured data that allows lawyers and accountants to predict what the law is. And so you come with your client's case and you enter it into the system, just like I showed, and then it compares your client's case to every case that's gone to, to court in the past, and it enables you to get a prediction. And so is my client an independent contractor or are they an employee? Well, here's, my, here's all the facts of my case, and here's um, how a court would likely, if the court acted the way that they've done in the past, here's how they would likely um, um, a rule in, in your client's case. Now you can imagine, and so this is this has been broadly used. The the, the, um, the regulators use this tool as well to help with their process. Um, you can imagine a regulator in an agency in antitrust doing something similar here, turning all that unstructured data about their past decisions into structured data. You make a comparison. Essentially, you're just making a comparison. What are we? Here's our new facts from this particular merger, comparing it to the 30,000 mergers that we've had before, this is not likely to raise any concerns because that's what we've done in the past, or this is likely to raise concerns. And so we've got software um, that's in tax law and in employment law, we do um, estimations on damages, for example. So all of these things use you know, very simple machine learning uh, algorithms, but the, the, the key uh, added value is really turning the, uh, that unstructured data into something that's structured that enables you to make those predictions. Daza, are you satisfied with the answer? Very satisfied. And I'll, I'll just close by, by um, singing out the mantra that I hope we'll all derive from this. Data-driven, measurable, model-based, algorithmic, and adaptive. You're like, let's, let's make it so. Thank you very much, Professor Casey. I saw you wanted to say something. We can give you the floor. I was just gonna comment on, on what uh, Anthony had said. I mean, all of that, and that gives you this, this like readily available source of, of data is the past decisions. And you know, it, it goes to the theme of, you know, that's great if we've been doing it right, right? So, so what, whether, you know, if we don't know the, 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 the purpose is like, un, you know, we can't quite define it, but we're like, you know, let's just keep doing what we've been doing. That's great. Of course, it also could identify problems with what we've been doing. And you know, I'll, I'll, this is, I'm stealing this from a colleague of mine uh, at Chicago, Sandal Mool Nathan, talks about the Amazon issue a few years ago when um, their, their hiring data was supposed to do what they've been doing in the past. And they, they re realized that it was uh, kind of having gender biased decisions. And basically you, you had the data, the algorithm using bad old data and perpetuating this problem. And then the interesting thing was he always points out is, and what was their solution? They shut the data down. Well, but it just pointed out that you've been doing this thing bad for all this time. And the solution shouldn't be, let's go back to what we were doing because we just found out that if we automate and do what we were doing, it's gender bias, right? Like in some sense, there, that data is great if you like what you've been doing, but it can also help identify that you don't. But that's a new challenge that goes back to the, now let's be honest, what do we wanna do? And if we've identified that what we have been doing doesn't match that, we've got to fix that one of two ways. You know, train humans or train the data. One way or the other, you've got to make, make a solution. And I, I think that's uh, a, you know, a step forward, whichever path you take, because you're fixing a you know, kind of a bad, not you know, the, the non-automated path wasn't working either. Thank you very much for those insights. Uh, now we'll open the floor to the questions from the audience. And the first question we got was from Professor Bill Kovacic, which was on the panel just before. It's a half a question, half a comment. He points out that one of the main assets of your paper is that it shows out how competition laws across the world seek to achieve different objectives, some of them economic, some of them non-economic. Now, the question is, to what extent do you think that AI could cope with objectives which seek, for instance, to, um, to protect the integrity of the political process. Does any of the Antonis want to have a go at that, or perhaps does I even? 
So, uh, so it's an interesting question. Could AI cope with a system that said, identify any mergers that identify the integrity of the political process? I'm, I'm sh I, I do not know of any, um, of any way to predict the, uh, that particular problem. And it's an extremely interesting question. Again, it would require people to know uh, to ex ante of tag something of, well, this is actually something that is concerning for the political process. Um, and it would also require us to agree upon, well, this is concerning for the, um, uh, the integrity of the political process. I don't, I don't, um, I, I have not considered how to, um, to put together that sort of algorithm. I don't know if Tony, if you want to jump in. Um, yeah, uh, I, you know, the, again, I'm not a, a a, a voting rights expert, but I would imagine if you if you wanted to do that, you'd have to have data on voting, and you'd have to have data of how um, you know, mergers between companies affected voting outcomes or voting participation. Uh, if that was again, like I'm just using that as an example of trying to identify the thing that is the the purpose or the objective, the the integrity of the political process. Is it um, your you know that this merger, these types of mergers changed voting behavior in the past. I don't imagine we have, I mean, we have anecdotal examples and, and people have been talking about that. I don't imagine we have massive data to, to do that on a merger by merger basis. But I, again, you'd have to really identify what you mean. Is it voting? Is it the dialogue in, in the public? What, what is it that, that you identify as the failure of integrity? I guess. Yeah, uh, the question actually raises this, this um, something that I probably should have emphasized a bit more. You could have algorithms that highlight a particular problem, um, disruption of political process. You could have you know, concerns, one that predicts prices, one that predicts you know, quality, et cetera. The question is putting them all together. Is once, once you've got these additional predictions, it's how do we balance those things? And that's really the main concern about the, the end of our, uh, you, you could have algorithms that make all these, you know, these partial predictions in some sense, or they, they're predictions, but only partial, only part of the problem. Daza, how do you feel about that? Um, I, uh, I tend to agree, <laughs> uh, basically. Um, I, I guess the, the one thing just rattling in the back of my head, and I, I don't, I hope it's helpful, is just that whenever I see the phrase AI and then attached to these big questions, uh, I always just feel it's good to take a moment and to, you know, take a closer look at like maybe not to even use the word the AI or the acronym and maybe just talk about, you know, technologies and systems, you know, that exist. And then uh, a lot of the presumed capabilities um, narrow considerably and become a lot more um, simple to, to talk about. Thank you very much for that. Now we have a question which goes into a slightly different direction from Carolyn Thomas. She points out that if we define the objectives of the law too clearly, we take out the flexibility inherent in the common law system. Now the question is, to what extent do we want to do that, especially if legislative change would take decades and decades to implement? Yeah, I think I, I referenced a little earlier. I, I, that's exactly right. Like if you if you say, here's the data set, here's the algorithm, that's the law, period, move on, um, you're going to lock in things in a way that would be problematic and we've never done before. Uh, and so you have to decide, as she suggests, like perhaps it's at the agency level, perhaps it's, and this is the paper that does mentioned earlier, you can imagine um, courts are the ones dealing, you know, like you, you have to think about the institution and an optimal kind of updating of, both, you know, you want to be getting, you know, the, the, the data about the world regularly, but also reviewing your policies regularly, reviewing those purposes, and you have to decide which institution that is. And of course, and I do agree, if you did it at a, if you did all of that at a legislative level, you're going to lock things in in a, in a problematic way. Yeah, I mean, this comes back to uh, trade-offs. Exactly, the question is exactly that. You know, there are there are costs from doing that. That you're locked in, you lose the dynamism of the law, but you gain speed and you gain um, consistency. And so, how do you trade those two things off? And that is another human problem that we have to. Just you, in one example, like we, Anthony mentioned stoplights, right? So if you just said, here's the data on traffic today, here's where we're putting all the stoplights. Uh, pass that into law and move on. Like 
five years from now, your stoplights would be a, a disaster, right? And so you'd want to say, here's the agency that you know collects data and you know regulates the algorithmic stoplights, right? That's the way you want to think about uh, all of law. That that's the simplest example, but I, I think it, it demonstrates the problem. You would you would have traffic jams endlessly if you just locked it in through a, a legislation. Desa, do you have any thoughts on how two clear objectives would ruin the flexibility of the common law system? Yeah, I do. Just at a very high level, um, two things. Number one, um, the, the common law is, we're so fortunate, I believe. Uh, of course, I've been indoctrinated in my system, but I believe we're very fortunate to have common law because it is so supple and such a great fit for um, innovative new technologies, especially of this type that can be tuned in ways that are adaptive um, and, and, can, and can take lots of little data points that we could express as precedent, for example. Um, and, but the other thing just in general is I, I, I feel like it's it, part of what I, in the context of this paper, uh, that's the anchor for this conversation. It, it seems to me that the best thing to do is give it a try, uh, and then and then to to see. Um, and you know, the last I mean, arguably the last session <laughs> we had this like stunningly big idea about like a new economy that almost feels like almost like science fiction, but it's important, you know, out of academia to set a vision over the horizon of how things could be when the economy and society is in a mature next state of a digital economy and information society. And now in this paper, we have something that's very practical. Like we assume no other changes in, in anything using stuff we already have laying around like data and, and like we could build these um, algorithms out of the box. It wouldn't be that hard. Um, and, and, and so I feel like the, 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 my, my overall take on this is I hope that we could end up somewhere in the middle uh, and we can look at applying capabilities like smart contracts and, and other classes of, cap of uh, technology capabilities in ways that can solve multiple problems by applying them once and not necessarily like a bespoke in a very bespoke way, because ultimately we're going to need to find ways to transform um, systemically, um, not everything at once, but um, hopefully in clusters of types of problems. So I know that wasn't exactly on point to the, to the, um, to the question, but the, that's at least what I was thinking when I was considering the uh, the topic. Thank you very much for this. And now, unfortunately, we have to move on to the last question of this panel, which comes from Brandon Maher. The question is, can you speak more deeply about the role of simulation, especially since simulation is different from prediction? I hand on the floor to the two Antonis for this one. You know, that, that's right. Um, so, um, there, and when I talk about some of the bail papers, they are involving, they, they uh, utilize some simulation. Yeah, so when I use the word prediction, I'm using it in a very um, loose way. I'm, I'm referring to a few different things. I'm referring to forecasting, and I'm also referring to um, prediction in the broader sense of, well, we know what we've done in the past. And if I give you a new fact pattern, and making a prediction based on that. And it's not necessarily forecasting what a court will do, but I'm just trying to put a probability on this. And that's essentially what this is doing. So we're just trying to put a probability on this. Um, so I can't speak too deeply about some of the simulation. Maybe Brendan, um, we can speak offline. I don't know, Tony, if you wanted to add more to that. I know that there are differences between you know, that simulation and the forecasting and the types of prediction that we are actually um, talking about here. I, I think that that's the view of it. Like you said, there's there, it, no, no prediction is that this is going to happen. It's a, you know, we're talking about probabilities and, and you know, talk offline about the specifics. Dazra, I don't know if you wanted to jump in there. Yeah, um, just at a very high level, uh, it, it, it's so in terms of the, the question, you know, uh, like simulation is not prediction, I guess, I, well, first of all, Brendan and I are friends. And so to take this with, with tremendous respect, but I actually have a different point of view. Um, it, I think that you can have descriptive, you know, models and simulations, and you can have predictive simulations, um, you know, depending on, you know, what, what you're trying to do. 
Uh, and I know like you, you and I both go way back with agent based, you know, simulations that are exactly trying to be predictive. Uh, but, um, but leaving that all aside, I think the, the underlying insight here that I hope we all take away, especially those of you who are regulators that may be looking at your 2023 budgets and what you might want to bring online for technology is um, the capability of having uh, being able to simulate something that's pretty close to um, to the cases and the reviews and the administrative actions and the and the economy and, and everything else here that, that you're trying to do is is really is terribly important. And one of the ways that I hope that we'll have simulations and models that are incorporated as part of administrative law itself is that when we look at, for example, a proposed new rule, like let's say the merger review rule is going to be, we're going to tweak some of the criteria in in the future. Um, right now in the US, we have like NPRMs, Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, and it's all like PDF medieval kind of stuff. Wouldn't it be nice if instead they actually had the rule in, in language, in natural language, and also showed us the model or at least a toy model and a simulation so that you could put in questions and get answers like, okay, let's say I'm a company of this size with, with this data sets and, and th this criteria, would I, would my merger be approved or not approved under the new proposed rule? You can actually get these answers when you express things as models in, in with simulations. And it's a great way to not just measure the performance of existing law and its success against, you know, goals that we need to do a better job defining, but you can also be able to evaluate future law which gets us into the idea of adapting well. Thank you very much for that. Now, I know that I advertised the last question as being the last, but we have two minutes left, and I will use them to combine the last two questions we got on the Q&A section. The essence of the questions is whether we should prefer to use unsupervised machine learning tools because they allow us to avoid labeling the mistakes we did in the past of merger control. What do you think about that? So if, if so, if I understand, just letting the, the past data speak and not um, labeling this is lets us not label the mistakes. I think uh, the issue there is that there, and I think this uh, goes earlier to the point about locking things in. Um, you, you're locking in the way we've done it. Um, that's easier to do, but you you, you lose the value of, of potentially identifying those mistakes and. Um, and I, and, and I'm, I'll hit on the theme Anthony hit, like the, the important part is that the humans have to decide what they want to do. Right. And this was, you know, the, the computation can't do that. And so all we'd be doing then is saying, Hey, um, that's a mystery. <laughs> Oh, it looks like we've lost Tony. Um, I'll, I'll just add, I mean, unsupervised machine learning is helpful for us, you know, identifying some of the patterns under the, but it's not particularly, um, I'm not sure it would be that particularly helpful. And it, um, so it is helpful in the sense of you get to learn lots about what's going on. Um, in terms of making predictions that you can turn into action, um, I think it's probably, you know, that's where you probably need your supervised machine learning, but that comes with an awful lot of costs. And that is, we need to be able to tag what an error is. And that's extraordinarily difficult. Thank you very much for all your thoughts and for presenting your paper, the two Antonies, for Daza, for very insightful comments and questions. Thank you as well for the attendees for the very insightful questions. And I hand it over to Thibault now for the next Thank panel. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Theodora. Um, just a quick note, as you understood, we are very good friends with people at the MIT and DAS group. So go visit the MIT Computational Law Reports. You go to law.mit.edu. I'm sure you're going to, yes. And maybe it will get me a beautiful hat. Uh, and they just released a new uh, release of the uh, Computational Law Reports just a week ago, and it's, it's mind-blowing. So go there and uh, give it a try. You'll like it.